The Billionaire CEO's Runaway Wife Written by E.T. Watson Narrated by Daniel Cuddy, Celia Stone, Lucy Topps, and Jim Swanson Chapter 45 Sarah sat in Tracy's office, anxiously fidgeting. Beside her, Lucas reached over to grip her hand in support. After successfully buying dresses, they had gone in search of masks. Following Alan's advice, they hit on a store called Abracadabra in Manhattan. The rather realistic props turned Lucas's stomach and he worried Zoe would be scared by some of the more grotesque decorations. However, she showed absolutely no fear and even found some of them funny. His confusion was not cleared up until Sarah informed him that they spent last Halloween in New Orleans. Nothing in that store compared to some of the displays they had seen while trick-or-treating. Not only did they find three matching golden black masks to wear, but also a spooky raven statue Zoe insisted they buy for Yaya's Halloween display. Apparently, Yaya took Halloween quite seriously. After success in the mask shop, Lucas took them to Mughalai Grill, only a 20-minute drive away. Both the mask shop and the restaurant proved to be high on Zoe's growing list of favorite places. Shopping and food were adequate distractions allowing Sarah to forget the meeting to come, but only just. Her nerves kept her awake and unable to sleep, even after talking long into the night with Lucas. They left Zoe under Ulima's care, and Lucas drove to Tracy's office. Now, as they sat, she kept fidgeting, and Lucas gripped her hand in encouragement. Sarah gave him a nervous smile. You got this, Lucas said. You are stronger than him, and there is nothing he can do to hurt you. Sarah breathed deep, letting his words sink in. He had said the same thing several times the night before. It was quickly becoming a mantra as she struggled to control her racing heart. She just wanted it to be over and done with. Hi, Sarah. Tracy greeted as she entered, sitting on the edge of her desk. Lucas. He nodded as her gaze bore into him. He'd always felt something hostile in her gaze, always scrutinizing his every move for motive and never giving up her suspicion. Now was no different. How are you doing? Tracy turned her attention back to Sarah. Fine. Sarah glanced at Lucas, reading his exasperated frown. About as well as can be expected. I've had a few nightmares, especially the first night. I still feel anxious when I'm alone. Lucas nodded. She didn't cry out when she slept anymore. But it was difficult for her to relax and fall asleep. They often spent hours talking until she finally drifted off. He was glad she wanted to talk to him, but still worried if it was enough. That's not uncommon. Tracy said. In fact, a lot of people in your situation suffer from insomnia, night terrors, and anxiety. You seem to be coping all right, though. Luke's been a big help just letting me talk it out, although he did suggest a professional if I wanted. Hmm, not a bad idea. Tracy agreed. It's good you want to talk and that you're comfortable talking about it. A lot of people are too ashamed of the event and usually bury it. If you decide that's a route you want to take, I can suggest some good ones. Sarah nodded. Anyway, the reason I called is because I have managed to contact some of his other victims. Tracy said. How many? Nine so far. We're still trying to track down the others. Tracy hesitated. One we know committed suicide shortly after the attack. Sarah shivered. Lucas squeezed her hand. Two have outright refused to speak to us. Tracy said. 
which is not unexpected. So far, only four have agreed to meet with us and discuss options. That's one reason. The second reason I asked you here is because his lawyer is trying to expedite the case. He wants it over and done with quickly, so we don't have time to prepare. Lucas scowled. I don't want you to worry about that. Taylor is helping to stall him, but his lawyer wants to meet you. Why? Sarah couldn't help but be surprised. He's probably hoping to intimidate you into dropping the charges. Tracy said. Like hell. Sarah declared. That's the attitude. Tracy smiled. If you're up to it, I'd like you to meet the other victims. How many are here? Six. As I said, only four have agreed to press charges so far. I'm hoping to convince the others. I'll talk to them. Sarah nodded and stood. Lucas moved to stand, but Tracy gestured for him to stay seated. It took a lot of work to get these women here. I'd rather not jeopardize their cooperation by introducing too many people. Lucas reluctantly agreed. No doubt, they would be more comfortable with other women, and he certainly didn't want to make them nervous. Sarah gave his hand a squeeze and flashed him a reassuring smile. I'll be right here if you need anything, Lucas said. But I don't think you will. Sarah followed Tracy to a small conference room with a long table. Around the table were six women. No two seemed to share a connection. Blonde, brunette, redhead, black hair, blue, brown, green eyes, tall, petite, thin, or curvy. None of them had the same features, at least to her eyes. Sarah selected a seat and hoped she didn't look as nervous as she felt while Tracy started the proceedings. You all know why you are here, and this may come as a shock, but you are all here for the same reasons. The women around the table gave each other hesitant looks. There is someone here who wants to talk to you. Sarah? Hi. Sarah greeted and hesitated before she began. My name's Sarah, although you may know me better as Rosemary Thomas. The author? One shyly asked. Yes. At the end of the week, my publisher will be holding a book release party and reveal my identity as a sort of stunt. I ask you to keep it to yourselves until then. A few days ago, I was attacked. I was drugged and sexually assaulted. Sarah gave them a moment to process her confession. Luckily, the attack was interrupted. My rescuer took me to the hospital and my attacker was arrested. But I know all of you weren't so lucky. She paused, looking at each of them. Some hung their heads in shame. Others blushed. And some seemed pensive, wondering where she was going with this confession. Our attacker is a coward in the lowest form of filth. He wants us too scared and ashamed to speak up. But I say to hell with what he wants. Sarah snapped, startling them. He doesn't get to choose. He's the one who should be hiding in shame. And I'm going to do everything I can to make sure he can't do this to anyone else. The others shared nervous glances. I know some of you might be afraid. You have lives to live and families to take care of. You have to make your own decisions about whether you want to accept Tracy's offer to charge him. Doing so means you will be forced to relive the worst night of your lives, so I understand if you don't want to. And there is no guarantee of conviction even if you do step forward. But if we stand together, they can't ignore all of us. He can't make us be silent. We are ones with power, not him. Aren't you afraid of what this will do to your reputation? One asked. I mean, everyone knows who you are. You're famous. If Rosemary Thomas can show other women they aren't alone, I'd call that a win. 
It happened so long ago. Another shivered. Can he even be convicted? There is no statute of limitations on first-degree rape. Tracy informed. And second degree has a 20-year statute. So we are well within the Lao time. I won't lie. The more time that has passed, the more difficult it will be to find variable proof. But I won't leave any stone unturned if you choose to proceed. In Sarah's case, we have eyewitnesses as well as hospital records. I want to send him away for the rest of his life. That's the criminal trial. After that, we can talk about civil hearings and the possibility of seeking compensation for all of you. Tracy paused, letting them digest what she said. His lawyer is trying to rush the process, so we have limited time to prepare. We are stalling him as much as possible. He does not get to decide the narrative. I will make sure your story is told. I'm in. A brunette at the end of the table said, Let's cut his balls off once and for all. A couple of others grimaced, but most seemed supportive of the idea. What do you need from us? One hesitantly asked. I need to hear what happened with as many details as you can remember. Place, time, date, anything we can check and verify. Tracy said. If we can, we'll locate camera footage, medical records, phone messages. The more variable proof we have, the better our case. I will dedicate every resource at my disposal to ensure justice is served. Several nodded, though they still looked nervous. What about the trial? You will have to give testimony. Tracy said. It's important for the judge and jury to hear your story from you. To put a face to it and know they will have to face you when they make their decision. I don't know if I can. One mumbled so low, she thought it went unnoticed. I'll be there. Sarah assured her. We all will be. We'll hold each other up and show him we're united. I also want to offer all of you trauma counseling. Tracy said. If you want someone safe to talk to, I know some great people. And we have to join your case to get that? A shy blonde asked. No. The counseling is free and not dependent on your cooperation with the case. Tracy shook her head. The counselors are medical professionals. Anything you say to them is protected by patient confidentiality and will not be used in court. Whether you choose to press charges or not, I encourage you to seek their help. Why would you do that? Because we are women. We take care of each other. We hold each other up and we protect each other. Tracy paused as her phone buzzed. She read the message before setting it back down. I'll give you some time to think about it and discuss the offer. You don't have to decide today, but the sooner we can get started, the better. Sarah? Sarah nodded and followed her out. They returned to her office, where Lucas anxiously waited. He stood as they entered. Sarah gave him a reassuring smile. His lawyer is here. Tracy said. Not a word about the others in conference. We're not sure he knows about them or not. They nodded, even as there was a knock on the door. Sarah and Lucas sat while Tracy answered it and ushered in the newcomer. Miss Lamont? The rather pudgy man in a suit said, by way of greeting. Randall? Tracy greeted. My client, Sarah Thomas, and Mr. Stanton. The rival lawyer's eyes widened as they settled on Lucas. Neither stood nor shook the lawyer's hand. 
So, what do you owe the pleasure of this visit? Tracy asked, leaning against her desk, not offering him a seat. Right. The lawyer cleared his throat. I have been authorized by my client to offer you a substantial sum and avoid public ridicule. Who's avoiding public ridicule? Sarah asked. Me or him? Because he's the one who should be worried. I will remind you, Miss Thomas, that this will be a public trial. The public does not look kindly on women with ruined reputations. Well, it's a good thing I don't have one. Sarah smiled. Which is more than your client can claim? Now, Miss Thomas, I don't think you are listening. No, you're the one who isn't listening. Sarah stood. You go and tell your client I will see him in court. And if he dares show himself to me anywhere or any time before then, I will give him a black eye to match his broken nose. She maintained a brave front until the lawyer departed. Once he was out of sight, she sank into her seat with a sigh. Lucas immediately wrapped an arm around her shoulder and held her close. You were amazing. He whispered. He's right. Tracy agreed. That was excellent. Sarah held up her hands to show them trembling. It was a lot easier to fake confidence than truly possess it. Lucas clasped her hands in his own, warming them. I should take you home, he said after a moment. We could both use some Zoe time. Sarah chuckled. She couldn't deny wrapping her arms around her little girl sounded good. After a moment, she said. Actually, we should go to the zoo. We still have two to visit before she sees them all. I'm in. Lucas said. Oh, Lucas. Tracy hesitated. I solicited James' phone records. I didn't find any texts or messages concerning the planning of the attack, but we have proof of Lydia contacting him both before and after. I hope you find proof she was involved, Lucas said. If we can find proof that she was his accomplice, she'll face jail time. Tracy reminded. Make sure you put her away for as long as possible, Lucas said. She's already lost her home and money, so I'm sure she'll appreciate the free accommodation. I'll keep that in mind. Tracy mimicked his sardonic smile. Shall we go to the zoo? Lucas looked at Sarah. She looked back at Tracy. Unless you still need me? Tracy shook her head. I'll be going over their testimony and allocating resources for the next few days. They may want to talk to you again. I'll let you know. Sarah nodded and stood. Lucas immediately pulled her close, whispering, You are amazing. The Billionaire CEO's Runaway Wife Written by E.T. Watson Narrated by Daniel Cuddy, Celia Stone, Lucy Topps, and Jim Swanson Chapter 46 Sarah sighed as she rode the elevator down to the tech floor. After the visit with the lawyer, she insisted on a day of merely lazing around the house. The books for the estate arrived, so she spent time looking through the crates, choosing ones that most interested her, while she sat on the patio watching Zoe run around her new play set with Daisy and Ulama's granddaughter Savannah. Ulama had been both surprised and thrilled Sarah remembered she had a granddaughter and encouraged her to bring the little one whenever she wanted. Sarah hoped the pair would be good friends. Lucas had to return to work, so it was the perfect time to recharge and relax. Nothing about this trip had gone as planned, but she didn't entirely regret that. She'd reconnected with Macy and Ava, Zoe had made friends with the kids and expanded her family many times over. 
they had even reconnected with Alice, who was the doting great-grandmother Sarah always knew she would be. Other things had not gone as expected. She knew facing Lucas was going to be difficult, but his desire to reconnect was a surprise. From the start, she'd been prepared for an argument, the same old recommendations, but he offered none. Instead, he practically begged to be a part of her life. Even now, it was hard to believe. She wasn't ready to forgive him, but that didn't mean she wasn't impressed by his commitment. Changing Zoe's room and installing a playset certainly spoke to his desire to be a father. He was caring and supportive, attentive and eager to show how much he wanted her to stay in his life. She had to admit it felt good for someone to be fighting for her for a change. That led her to another issue she had yet to face, which is what brought her to the Stanton offices today. Leaving Zoe with Lucas, where she was certain he wouldn't get any work done, she headed to the IT offices. She followed Lucas's directions to her goal. Pausing at the door, she took a deep breath and almost laughed. Why was she so nervous? Knocking, she opened it and stepped inside. Samuel sat at the computer, attention glued to the screen as he said, Leave your complaints in the box. I'll get to it eventually. Some things never change, Sarah sighed. You're still not much of a people person, are you? Samuel practically leapt to his feet in surprise. He stared wide-eyed at the figure standing at the door. Though he asked for this meeting to happen, some part of him didn't think it would really happen. Are you going to offer me a chair? Sarah asked. Right. Samuel hesitated before stumbling around for his desk and offering the only chair besides his own for her to sit. Sarah took a seat and watched as he nervously circled back to his chair. He sat leaning over his desk, then changed his mind. Standing, he wheeled it around to face her before sitting again. She watched his anxious fidgeting, struggling not to laugh, and she thought meeting Lucas again was awkward. So, how have you been? Sarah asked. I, uh, I've been good. Samuel hesitated. Busy. With work. And you? Same, Sarah nodded. I opened my own antique shop, you know, like the one Mum always wanted to have. A smile stretched his face. Their mother always talked about opening her own antique store. Several times their father promised to buy her one, but he never followed through. It was only one of many broken promises. So I heard. You divorced Lucas? I did, yes, Sarah said. I left because I thought that's what he wanted. Now he's trying like hell to convince me to stay. I don't know if it's a case of absence makes the heart grow fonder or if Zoe tamed the beast, but it's nice to have someone chasing after me for a change. Samuel grimaced. For years, he had focused only on what interested him and what he wanted to do. People were illogical and unpredictable. Numbers and computer code made sense and were safe. For his own comfort, he slowly cut out everything that didn't fit into his little sphere, and while that did make his world more predictable, it came at a cost. He was only just discovering. Samuel had no idea that Sarah had become a mother or that he had a niece. He didn't have a right to complain. After all, it wasn't just Sarah who walked away. So did he. Have you spoken to Dad lately? Sarah asked. No, I don't even know where he is now. Reno. How do you know? Samuel looked suitably impressed and confused. Alice. Mrs. Stanton? How would she know? A better question is, what doesn't she know? Sarah sighed. So, Lucas told me you were a big help figuring out what happened three years ago. Oh, that... that was nothing. Anyone could synchronize multiple camera feeds. Well, thank you. Sarah said. You know, you should learn to take a compliment better than a complaint. Samuel stared at her for a moment before laughing. No one ever knocked on his door unless they absolutely had to. Perhaps he could use some practice socialising? Lucas asked if we could start over. Sarah continued. So far, he's done a rather impressive job proving he can do better, so I'm going to make you the same offer. You forgive me? No, of course not. Sarah shook her head. But let's start over and see how it goes. Samuel sucked in a breath and nodded, 
Shaking her offered hand, he smiled. This was probably the best outcome he could hope for after everything. Come on, Sarah stood. Where? There's someone I'd like you to meet. Sarah didn't say another word as she led him out of his office. Several people stopped to watch as the pair walked by. They'd never seen their boss with a woman before, let alone such an attractive one. Sarah paid them no mind, but Samuel couldn't help but shoot them annoyed glares at the lack of their decorum. Still, he could hardly blame them. His sister was gorgeous. Lucas would have to watch her closely, or someone might try to win her heart out from under him. Um, Mr. Tomlinson? A braver subordinate approached as they finally reached the elevator. Samuel paused. Is that woman, like, your girlfriend? Samuel snorted, shaking his head. She's my sister. He left the stunned tech behind to join Sarah as she stepped on the elevator. They rode it in silence. Samuel fidgeted, and he wondered just where they were going and who she wanted him to meet. Surely not a family counsellor. Maybe Uncle Taylor? The elevator doors opened, revealing the executive level. Samuel looked around in confusion as Sarah stepped off and led him to Lucas's office, nodding to the secretary as they passed. Did Lucas need to see him about something? Nearing Lucas's office, they heard a muffled cry. Again? How do you keep winning? Opening the door without knocking, Sarah surveyed the scene she had expected. Lucas and Zoe sat across from each other over the coffee table. A deck of cards was strewn between them as well as a plate of snacks and juice bottles. Alan chuckled as he watched the pair working from the desk Lucas vacated. That's because I'm good, Zoe declared. Daisy barked agreement from where she laid, licking crumbs off the floor. Next round, we'll play poker, Lucas said. At least that has rules I understand. Poker you understand, but go fish you don't? Sarah asked. Honestly. Oh. Lucas sat up. You're back. That was fast. Well, I don't like to waste time. Sarah perched on the couch's armrest beside him. I thought you said she wouldn't be any trouble, and that she wouldn't be in the way of your work. She's not, Lucas said. Work is getting done. Alan snorted, earning a glare. Sarah chuckled. Clearly, they needed a lesson on boundaries. Mommy, who's that? Zoe asked, pointing to Samuel, who stood staring at her with a shocked, longing expression. Sarah motioned for Zoe to join her as she knelt on the ground. Zoe, this is my brother Samuel. He's your uncle. Samuel sucked in his breath. The introduction was rather blunt, but that didn't change the fact his niece stood in front of him, looking like a playful sprite in a rainbow shirt, denim jacket and skirt. Her blonde hair was in pigtails with colourful ties. Zoe studied him for a long moment before rushing up to him. She raised her arms and looked at him expectantly. Samuel looked at her in confusion. Lucas chuckled at his hopelessness. She wants you to pick her up. She finally said. Samuel frowned but stooped to pick Zoe up as instructed. Even before he settled her on his hip, she wrapped her arms around his neck and kissed his cheek. Samuel straightened his face, pale with shock. Zoe smiled, unaware of his discomfort. Hello, Uncle Sam. I'm Zoe. <sighs> Hi, Zoe. Samuel stuttered, unprepared for the three-year-old's openness and welcome. Are you coming to Mommy's party? Party? Samuel repeated. Oh, right, your invitation, Sarah said, removing a small envelope from the pocket of her jacket she had left lying on the couch and handed it to him. I had Ruth print a special one for you. Accepting it, Samuel moved to the other couch and sat down with Zoe in his lap before opening it. You are cordially invited to the Masquerade Ball, celebrating Rosemary Thomas's new book, time and time again. Please wear a mask and enjoy the festivities. At the end of the night, Rosemary will reveal herself. Present this invitation at the door for you and your plus one to attend. A masquerade for Rosemary Thomas? Samuel said. Several of my subordinates were talking about this. So you are a fan too? Lucas chuckled. Actually, 
I am Rosemary Thomas, Sarah said. Samuel blinked, expecting a laugh or just kidding, but Sarah maintained a straight face. Lucas and Alan offered encouraging smiles and shrugs. You are Rosemary Thomas? For real? Samuel asked. My mommy is the bestest. Zoe declared. Isn't she, Uncle Sam? He looked at the happy girl and couldn't help but smile. Lucas watched from his seat, feeling prickles of jealousy. It was hard watching anyone else get his daughter's time and affection, even if that someone was her uncle. Still, he could share. Certainly the three-year-old would be a good influence, and he wouldn't have to worry any more about complaints over Samuel's attitude. Are you coming to the party? Zoe asked. Yeah, come on, Samuel. Lucas said. It'll be fun. I'm not really good with parties. Samuel hesitated. It's a party, Sammy, Sarah said, using the childhood nickname he hated. You just need to show up and relax. And if you need help learning how to have fun, Zoe will be happy to teach you. Why don't you come over for dinner? Lucas said. You can practice tonight, and this card shark can teach you how to lose at Go Fish. It's really not that hard of a game. Sarah scoffed, giving him a suspicious glance. Lucas shrugged. Maybe for some people. The plot thickens. The eagle. Sarah Thomas, formerly Sarah Stanton, shocked New York with her sudden return. She'd made several appearances since, even gracing the Delaire mixer and earning clear favour with the prominent family. The former Mrs Stanton had also been seen rubbing elbows with the Prescotts, making her a person everyone wanted to know. Those who have gotten closer to her say she is witty and charming, sophisticated and elegant. And it isn't just society who has taken notice. She has been seen numerous times with her ex-husband, Lucas Stanton, along with a three-year-old. Though no official statements have been issued by the Stanton family, many speculate the little one may be in fact Lucas Stanton's daughter. While the Stantons remain silent, a spokesman for the Delairs offered a simple answer. If Lucas is smart, he won't let Sarah go a second time. And we couldn't agree more. Several pictures of the couple at the amusement park, the beach, and shopping accompanied the article. But Lydia couldn't stand it and threw her phone across the room. It hit the wall and bounced off onto the ground with a sickening crack. Would you be careful with that? Patricia admonished as she entered the bedroom her hair wrapped in a towel. And pick up your things. This room is a mess. Lydia huffed, glaring at her suitcases propped on the low dresser, their contents strewn about. She had been looking for her black cocktail dress when her phone buzzed with the new alert. The thought of calling a maid to deal with the mess occurred to her before being stomped out. They were no longer at home. They had been kicked out with only an hour to pack as much as they could without assistance and lug their bulging cases to Madeline's car. Arriving in a luxury hotel, they tried to reserve a suite with a credit card, only to be denied. Apparently, Lucas's threat was all too real. They had no funds. Madeline only had a small condo, but offered to put them up in her guest room. The room was tiny, and mother and daughter were forced to share a bed. Not only that, but Madeline didn't have mates, just a housekeeper that cleaned once a week. Lydia supposed beggars couldn't be choosers, but this situation was intolerable. Lydia's gaze shifted to the table where they had laid out every scrap of jewellery they managed to pack. They had grabbed as much as they could, but it was not even half of what they originally owned. What was more in their haste? They hadn't bothered to make sure they had complete sets. In many cases, they missed a bracelet, earring or necklace that was meant to be worn together. The value of incomplete sets would be vastly reduced if they tried to sell it. Her gaze went back to her dresses. Many were quite valuable and worn only once. Lydia pressed her lips together. They had no choice. They would have to sell as much as they could. It would probably only mean a million or two at most, which would last them a couple of weeks if they budgeted. They had to figure out something more permanent unless she wanted to get a job, which was out of the question. It was so unfair. They couldn't even complain to grandmother. She tried to call the old bat, but the butler who answered said Mrs. Alice was quite busy. Lydia didn't believe it for a minute, but there was nothing she could do unless she wanted to crawl on her hands and knees to beg at the old woman's feet. She looked at her phone. Public opinion was definitely on Sarah's side. 
everyone seemed to support her, and she was winning approval from New York's most prominent families. The Delairs, Prescotts, Stantons. What next? The Worthingtons? Avery? It wasn't fair. Lydia had scraped and scrounged for her position, and now it was all in jeopardy because of some nobody? She had to find a way to turn this around. There was no way she was just going to stand idly by while that tramp waltzed around like she owned the city. Lydia, you'll never believe what just came in the mail. Madeline burst into the room. Patricia ticked her tongue at the rude entrance, but could hardly complain as it was Madeline's home. Lydia sighed and looked at her friend with something of an exasperated look. In the past, Madeline had always tugged at Lydia's skirt, paying her compliments and earning her favour. Though they were friends, there was a clear hierarchy with Lydia first. She was a Stanton with all the privileges such a position afforded. But now, Madeline was in the position of privilege. Though her means were nowhere near Lydia's usual standards without the steady income of her job, Madeline would soon be in the same situation Lydia now found herself in. Without a new beneficiary, Madeline might be able to stay in her condo for a month, perhaps two, before she would be as homeless just as they were. They had to find a solution before then, and no bit of mail was going to help. What is it? An invitation. Madeline gushed and read it. You are cordially invited to the Masquerade Ball celebrating Rosemary Thomas's new book. Isn't that exciting? It's supposed to be a super exclusive event. How'd you get an invite? I don't know. Madeline said. I'm always signing up for stuff. I must have gotten lucky. Right. Lydia grumbled. This was just her luck. Why did she care about Rosemary whatever? Wait, Rosemary. That was the author everyone was gushing over. Lydia hurriedly retrieved her phone. Ignoring the crack running through the screen, she searched for Rosemary Thomas. Pages and pages of results flooded her phone. Apparently... Rosemary was quite famous and hugely successful, enjoying the bestseller list every year. With the 10th book soon to come out, she had to be a millionaire, maybe even a billionaire. If Lydia could earn her favour, they could at least buy time to figure out something more permanent. Is the invitation only for you? Lydia asked. Um, no, it says you and your plus one. Excellent. Lydia straightened. Now we just have to find something to wear. The Billionaire CEO's Runaway Wife Written by E.T. Watson Narrated by Daniel Cuddy, Celia Stone, Lucy Topps, and Jim Swanson Chapter 47 Climbing out of the limo, Lucas reached to offer a hand to help his elegant date out. Sarah emerged, her gown sparkling in the light as she moved. Her hair was twisted and pinned at the back of her head, keeping it neatly tamed. A black and gold mask hid half of her face. As always, she kept her makeup to a minimum. After her, Zoe exited next, wearing a matching mask and her princess dress. Because it looked so much like Belle's dress from Beauty and the Beast, Sarah styled her hair like the Disney princess as well. As always, Daisy hopped out alongside her on a leash and wearing a gold jester collar to match their decided color scheme. Lucas chuckled, adjusting his own mask and straightening his gold tie before picking up the three-year-old as the limo departed. Offering his arm to Sarah, they walked the red carpet together. At the door, security stopped them, asking for invitations. Sarah withdrew it from her clutch with a smile. The guard nodded, ushering them in. The invitations allowed for two adults, while children were allowed in free, as were dogs, though it was likely Daisy would be the only canine in attendance. I can't believe the author herself has to show an invitation to attend her own book party, Lucas joked as they made their way inside. No one knows I'm the author, so... Sarah trailed off. 
It was all part of the charade. In a few hours, it would be over, and everyone would know who she was. She breathed deep, trying to calm her nerves. Lucas's arms slipped around her waist as he whispered, "They are going to love you." Sarah chuckled. Oh, there you are! Good. Ruth greeted, hurrying up to them, wearing a red and black gown with a mask to match. I was worried you might chicken out at the last minute. Really? Sarah scoffed and rolled her eyes. Would Ruth ever have faith in her? How is everything? Perfect. Silas and Ava are already here with the kids. Tracy and Thomas are coming later. She's been busy at the office. Sarah grimaced and nodded. She could only imagine. Oh. You know who is here too? Ruth winked. Both of them. I was wondering if they would show up. Why did you want me to invite them anyway? There's no reasons. Ruth mischievously grinned. Well, I can't wait. Let me know if you need skewers for the spit you're planning to roast them on. Right. Who are you talking about? Lucas asked. Let's just say I had a little something planned for a certain pair of pains even before you got involved. Sarah looped her arm around his. Lucas's brow furrowed in confusion before he finally caught on to her meaning. He smirked. You are vicious. I like it. Shall we mingle? Lucas nodded. All too happy to mix with the other guests, as long as she was at his side. Puppy! Ben exclaimed, as they neared the table where Silas and Ava had congregated the kids. Lucas reluctantly set Zoe on her feet so she could play with the other kids and the dog. He watched her with a concerned gaze, keeping an eye out for anyone who tried to interrupt. As he gazed around. His eyes fell on Silas, who smirked at his vigilance. Lucas frowned, trying to remain serious, but only held the expression for a beat before shaking his head with a sheepish grin. Three years ago, he never imagined he would be in this position. Um, hello. Lucas turned to see Samuel hesitantly approach them. The latter looked exceedingly uncomfortable in formal wear, not to mention the mask. Even so, he had to give the other credit for coming to support Sarah. Hello, Sammy. Sarah smiled. Try to relax and have fun. R- right. Uncle Sam. Zoe ran up to him. Do I look like a princess? The adults chuckled as she spun. Yes, you do. Samuel smiled as some of his tension eased. Thank you. Hope we're not late. Julius greeted as the entire Delaire family joined them. In addition to Macy and the kids, March and Rose, Jude and Jessica, as well as Augustus himself. shattered by his assistant were in attendance the large group garnered quite a few double takes as it was unusual to see all of them especially augustus out together hello zoe lyra and aria greeted with curtsies like her they were dressed in princess style dresses in two different shades of green hello zoe curtsied back She was having a lot of fun with their game of pretend and earned more chuckles from the amused adults. It must be nice to have a little sister to dress up with. Alexis lamented. Mom, I really hope you have a girl this time. Don't worry, Lexi. Zoe said. I already told you. Yaya said you'll have lots of sisters. Yeah, yeah. Julius repeated. Yaya is my college roommate's aunt. 
Sarah explained. She's a bit eccentric, but very wise. Yaya is never wrong, Zoe declared. Sounds like someone I should know. They turned to see Alice approach in her motorized wheelchair. Like everyone, she was dressed formally with the mask. Several members of the crowd murmured at her presence. It was the first time she had been seen in public in almost a decade. Well, if it isn't Alice Stanton, Augustus greeted. What rock did they dig you out from under? Hello, you old blowhard. Alice countered. You still alive? We're not going to have to separate you two, are we? March eyed his father. Of course not. Augustus waved off his concern. What's a few playful jabs between old friends? Right, Alice? Naturally. What are the rest of the old guard? I can't remember the last time I had the displeasure of Emerson's company, to say nothing of Richard. Alice agreed. They'll be along. Silas smiled, already anticipating the moment his father and father-in-law met the Stanton matriarch. It's quite a drive from the estate, so they'll be here later. How is it with them I've been meaning to ask? Sarah said. They used to be bitter rivals, but from what I hear, Emerson has practically moved in with your parents. Silas shrugged. Mergers made for strange bedfellows. Carlisle Enterprises was no more, giving Emerson plenty of free time, and he had to share his grandchildren with his one-time rival, Richard. The pair seemed in competition to win the most affection from their grandchildren. According to my mother, those two spend most of their time on the patio regaling each other about their business exploits. Silas said. She says it's like listening to two fishermen telling their fish stories, with just as many exaggerations. Those two always made everything a competition. Alice shook her head. I don't know how many times they almost drove their companies bankrupt trying to outdo the other. We'll talk later. I've got stories that will curl your toes. Silas gave her a dubious look. I'd like to hear them for myself. Augustus smiled. Shall we have a nice chat? That's fine. I'm glad you came. Sarah smiled as yet another socialite left after speaking with her. She sipped her champagne, glancing around the room. There were several people who seemed eager to speak to her, and she hadn't even revealed herself yet. How are you holding up? Mercy asked, as she, Ava, Rose, and Jessica approached. All right, it's amazing how many people want to talk to me. Macy, Rose, and Ava shared knowing looks and laughed. Jessica looked around nervously as eyes continued to follow their small group. What? Sarah asked. We're sorry. Ava shook her head. But it's so strange to hear you say that. Is it? Have you not been reading the gossip columns? Macy asked. They are all abuzz with you and Lucas. Really? But we haven't said anything. People have eyes. Rose laughed. What do you expect after your little beach getaway? Sarah blushed as the memory of that day ran through her mind. You two sure seem to be getting along. Macy agreed. Okay, I know what you're going to say. Sarah shook her head. And it's not like that. Right now, we're just friends. Macy and Ava stared at each other, equal parts suspicious and amused. Really? 
Sarah insisted. You know you two are the worst. The only ones worse than you is Aubrey. Thank God she's not here. Macy and Ava laughed heartedly. Sarah rolled her eyes and turned her attention to Jessica. Though she had heard about Jude's newfound love interest, she missed the opportunity to meet her at the mixer. Are you having a good time, Jessica? Sarah asked, wanting to change the subject. Yes. She blushed. I just can't believe I'm here with M. Gray and Ava Prescott. I mean, you two are famous. And I might actually get to meet Rosemary Thomas. What should I do if she says hi to me? Do you think she'll sign my books for me? <gasps> Would that be too unprofessional? Maybe I shouldn't ask. I never imagined this when Jude first asked me out. Macy, Ava, and Rose struggled not to laugh, stealing glances at Sarah, who maintained a neutral expression. She had plenty of years of practice, given how many times people talked about Rosemary around her. What do you think she's like? Jessica asked. I think she'll be just as you imagine. Sarah assured her. Only more so. But she's so worldly. She's probably going to think I'm plain and boring. Jessica said. I mean, look at me. I'm not nearly as glamorous as any of you. She won't think that. Sarah assured her. Promise, she's just an ordinary person. And you would know all about being ordinary? Sarah turned to see Lydia and Madeline, both dressed in small black dresses with masks covered in black lace. Considering the invitation called it a ball, most women had opted for a full-length gown. In contrast, Lydia's choice was wholly inappropriate considering how many children were in attendance. At least I'm not parading around with my ass hanging out. Sarah said. A little desperate for attention, are we? We'll see who is desperate when Rosemary calls us on stage. Lydia smiled. And why would she do that? Macy asked. Well, we're best friends, after all. Lydia loudly declared for all to hear. And when she finds out what you did, she won't rest until you go crawling back to your rock. Really? Sarah struggled not to break her expression. I guess we'll see how this night plays out. Yes, we will. Lydia turned up her nose and walked away with Madeline in tow. Macy, Ava, and Rose broke out into uncontrolled laughter, though Jessica remained apprehensive. Sarah shot them warning glances, not to ruin the game. I'm not sure what is so funny, Jessica said. I mean, they really could be friends with Rosemary Thomas. What if they are? No, sweetie. Rose squeezed her shoulder. This is only your second event. After a few more, you'll start realizing not everyone is genuine. In fact, many are consummate fakes. But how do you know? Jessica asked. It's not like we know who Rosemary is. Rose hesitated. It's very simple if you think about it. Sarah said. The invitation said masquerade ball, which implies a certain dress code. Now, would a real friend of the author come to this event dressed like them? Jessica thought it over. I see what you mean. Sarah gave her an encouraging smile and squeezed her shoulder. This is really hard and confusing. Jessica complained. I thought these were just parties. If it helps, think of these events like battlefields. Macy said. Everyone is trying to take as much ground as possible with their little circles of influence. And the winner isn't always the one with the largest group. Ava added. 
you also have to consider the individual members. The more prestigious they are, the more ground they automatically have. Then what about us? Jessica asked. We have two Delaires, one of which is M. Gray and Ava Prescott. Exactly, Sarah said. And technically, we have three Delaires. Oh, but I'm not. You came with my son. Rose smiled. That makes you one, and a lot of people are going to approach you just because you are. Jessica took a gulp of her champagne. I don't know if I can do this. What if I do something wrong? I used to worry about the same thing. Ava said. But there is one thing to always keep in mind: you are a Delaire, so nothing you do is ever wrong. But no, she's right. Sarah agreed. Even if you make a mistake, you are never wrong. Society will forgive you of almost everything. Just because I'm associated with the Delaires and the Prescotts, Ava added, and the Stantons. I'm not a Stanton. Sarah corrected. Yet, Macy and Ava said in unison, and laughed at her exasperated glare. The billionaire CEO's runaway wife, written by E. T. Watson, narrated by Daniel Cuddy, Celia Stone, Lucy Tops, and Jim Swanson. Chapter forty-eight. What's on your mind, Samuel? Lucas asked. Beside him, the nervous tech looked across the sea of people. He wasn't fond of crowds, but he was determined to stay for his sister's big reveal. His gaze sought her out, and he watched her laughing easily with Macy and Rose Delaire, as well as Avalon Prescott. She seemed completely comfortable talking with anyone daring enough to approach, but she was always more gregarious than him. Samuel's attention shifted to Zoe, who sat in her great grandmother's lap as she munched hors d'oeuvres. At the same table, Augustus Delaire. Richard and Opal Prescott and Emerson Carlyle all sat with various grandchildren in their laps, talking easily with each other, despite the bitter rivalries they used to share. Like her mother, Zoe seemed perfectly at home among the New York business giants. Samuel. He jerked to attention, looking at Lucas. Samuel hesitated, not sure how to express his thoughts without offending, considering he stood in a group consisting of Julius, March, and Jude Delaire, Silas Prescott. And Lucas Stanton. A bit surreal, isn't it? Julius offered. Yeah, a bit. Samuel agreed. My sister was always a natural, though. She would never allow anyone to see her sweat. She's a strong woman. Lucas said. She's had to do a lot of things on her own, but not anymore. Samuel nodded. His sister would not be alone anymore. She would have help and support. There you are. They looked at Thomas and Tracy finally arriving. We were beginning to wonder about you. Silas said. I know. There is just so much to prepare. Tracy sighed. I can't even imagine how difficult this is for all the victims, but several have asked for counseling, so. I'm hoping this will turn out to be a good experience for them. They have the support of some very strong, amazing women. Lucas said. If James isn't afraid now, he will be. The others nodded in agreement. Once the case went to trial, it was sure to put all of New York on notice. Where is Sarah? Tracy asked. They gestured to the other group where the women had staked their claim. Kissing Thomas on the cheek, she immediately headed over to the other group. Silas chuckled even as Thomas blushed under his mask. Seems I missed something. Taylor said as he arrived. Samuel, is that you? Uncle Taylor? Samuel stood straight up. I didn't expect you here. And miss your sister's big day? I think not. 
Besides, I've hardly spent any time with my grandniece. Her father had been hogging every minute. Lucas smirked. Well, now you're going to have to fight a great-grandma for attention. Taylor followed his gesture to the table of grandparents and grandkids. He seemed suitably impressed to see so many together, all seemingly amicable and in good humor. Well, that's a sign I never thought I'd see, Taylor said. Quite impressive how people can come together over their grandchildren. You're not wrong. Silas agreed, eyeing his father and father-in-law. While there were still some awkward moments between the triplets and their grandfathers due to their bad first impressions, Isaac and Ben fully accepted both. How about we have a seat, Samuel? Taylor suggested. There's a lot for us to catch up on. Samuel nodded as Taylor clapped him on the back and they wandered off to find a table for themselves. Though he was nervous about facing his uncle, it was better than facing the crowd. Lucas watched them go, hoping this interview would go well for both. The holidays would certainly be a lot less awkward if they all found middle ground. Is that Alan? Thomas suddenly asked. Lucas turned eagerly, looking for his friend and assistant. Alan warned he would be late for the event, though he couldn't explain why. Now Lucas understood. Alan hadn't come alone. Alongside him was another gentleman in a suit with a matching mask. From this distance, Lucas couldn't be certain, but he was pretty sure it was Kyle. Something you want to share with the class? Lucas asked, seeing his smirk. Anyone we know? Probably not. I'm pretty sure that is Kyle. Lucas said. He runs Sarah's antique store. They met last week when Alan and I went to check it out. I uh, guess they hit it off better than I thought. Nice. Julius nodded. You going to say hi? No, he'll introduce us when he's ready. Lucas shook his head. Alan's been so busy trying to keep me on track. He deserves his own time. Hey, Nick. You lost? Silas asked, catching the attention of a young man as he walked by. He turned, seemingly surprised that he'd been recognized. Unlike most who had come as a couple, Nicholas had come alone. He normally didn't like attending events because many women used it as an excuse to approach him. But now his family's ongoing competition was well known, and though he had long ago bowed out of it, many assumed he wanted to catch up to his brothers. However, a masquerade had the appeal of an army, so he had agreed to take his sister's invitation. Oh, Silas! Nicholas fell into their group. And Julius, Thomas, Lucas. Hi, I wasn't expecting to see all you together. It's like the great trifecta. The others chuckled. But I'm glad you're here, Luke, because I've been meaning to congratulate you. Nicholas said. Me? Yeah. Remember, we were just talking about finding the woman of our dreams. You found yours. Congrats. Lucas blushed as the others looked at him. That's right, they did have that conversation. In fact, it was the same night Sarah made her debut. He had forgotten everything else. Thanks, Nick. Lucas said. You'll find yours. Yeah. Nicholas sighed. I just don't know anymore. I do. Lucas said. No one deserves it more than you. Believe me. Thanks. Oh, Sarah, there you are. Ruth said approaching the group. It's time. Sarah sucked in a breath. She glanced at her watch and realized how late it had gotten. Nervously, she sought out Zoe, only to see her ensconced with Alice. Her gaze then picked out Lucas, who stood with the other men. In addition to Julius and Silas, she also recognized Thomas, along with someone she didn't know. As the men talked, Alan approached the group with someone new. Kyle? That was new, and a story she definitely wanted to hear. She finally spotted Samuel in the corner talking to Taylor. Everyone was here. Sarah! 
Jerking to attention, she faced Ruth again. Nervously smiling, Sarah excused herself and followed after her editor. Jessica was confused by her sudden departure, but Macy, Ava, Rose and Tracy merely smiled. There would be quite a few people surprised at the reveal to come. Ruth escorted Sarah behind the stage they had set up with a small makeshift changing room. There, Sarah found a flowery yellow dress. Its bottom hem was uneven and layered, not quite full length like her current gown. They had chosen it because it fit Zoe's chosen colour scheme, as well as Rosemary's eccentric persona. Also in the room was her black wig and makeup kit. Sarah changed, slipping out of one dress and into the other. She fiddled with the thick wig. Her hairstyle tonight was done specifically to make it easy to fit the wig over her natural hair. Sarah adjusted it, turning her head to make sure her blonde hair was properly hidden. This was one thing she wasn't going to miss. The wig was hot and heavy, and when she sweated in warm weather, it was rather itchy. She couldn't wait to say goodbye to it. Normally, she used plenty of blush and eyeshadow when becoming Rosemary, but because of the mask, she skipped it tonight. She did use her lipstick to paint her lips bright red as usual, before giving herself a final look in the mirror and was pleased with the results. Tonight would be the last time she had to dress up to become Rosemary. It was kind of sad in a way, like she was saying goodbye to a longtime friend. But in reality, she and Rosemary were becoming one. Finally, she could shed the cocoon and fly on her own. With a deep breath, she stepped out to join the waiting Ruth. Ruth smiled excitedly, clapping at her transformation. It was time. Are you ready? No, but let's do it anyway. All right, here we go. The lights dimmed except for the ones above the stage, drawing everyone's attention. Conversation slowly died down as everyone made their way closer to the stage, aside from those at the tables, as they already had front row seats. Macy and the others returned to their partner's sides, sharing looks of anticipation. Zoe vacated her grandmother's lap, seeking her father who scooped her up and eagerly waited alongside the others. Lucas scanned the crowd. He picked out a few people he knew before his gaze fell on Lydia and Madeline, pressing as close to the stage as they could. Scowling, he had half a mind to throw them out, but he wouldn't take away Sarah's moment. She intended to put them in their places herself. Ruth quietly stepped onto the stage to stand in front of the microphone. Next to her was a large board showing a blown up image of the cover of the new Rosemary book, as well as a table with the new book on display. She smiled at the eager crowd. Welcome, friends, family, book lovers. We are here not just to celebrate the 10th book of an amazing series. We are also here to celebrate an amazing career of an amazing woman. For years, Rosemary Thomas has regaled us in stories that boggle the mind and so fast-paced they leave us breathless, wanting more. Every year, people clamor for the next book, eager to read the next adventure. This eagerness is due in part because of Rosemary herself, who, despite making several public appearances and book signings, has kept herself secret, hiding her identity and encouraging all of us to learn about her through her books. As she has claimed in the past, many of her stories are based on fact. It should come as no surprise to anyone that her warm and generous nature is no fabrication. She did really go to school to become a teacher, and she really did teach in an actual classroom. She has been to Paris, hobnobbing with famous artists, She's been to Madrid, London, Berlin, Rio, Sydney, just to name a few places. She has gone rock climbing, skydiving, scuba diving. She has seen mysterious lights over the desert and danced in the streets during Mardi Gras. She's competed in the rodeo and skied the Alps. She is everyone and no one. In fact, some people think she is a fabrication a person made up to sell books. But she is very real. I know this because she is my best friend. So allow me to formally introduce Rosemary Thomas. The crowd clapped as a new figure emerged from behind the curtain. Several people murmured at the sight of the tall, elegant figure clad in gold. Her black hair seemed to shimmer under the lights, 
as she smiled to the crowd and took her place at the microphone.